guys. Oh. You almost don't need to call it limited edition Aston Martin. They just sell as many as they can, which is probably less than less than 300 anyway. My decision on his car was a 205 CTI Roland Garros. One did this, hit the other one, whacked into the A-pillar, punctured the A-pillar, ripped the trim off it, uh, yeah. and then the wiper decided, with the metal bit, decided to, um, to sort of eject itself over the top of the car. Welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 57. I've spent two days in a loft inhaling that lovely glass wool stuff, so I sound even worse than usual. First of all, this week, what have we done in cars this week? Neil Clifford, you have the busiest car life of us all. Endless stories, regale us with one of them. I've got two. Go on. I went to, oh, uh, I went to the Haynes Motor Museum. Oh, lovely. Has anyone ever been there? We've been there. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Every time I drive past it, I think I must go in there. Yeah, it's really good. I went for a, for a, a little jaunt with my mates, just driving basically around Somerset. We went for a lovely cooked breakfast down there, and we went to Bruton, which is all very posh now, and five yeah. pounds for an orange, but lovely. And then we went to the Haynes Motor Museum. What a dude that guy was. The Red yeah. Room. Full of 50 red cars, including a right-hand drive, original, unrestored Cobra from 1964. Amazing. So that was really good. I'd highly recommend it. And um, I'm sure we were talking about the Haynes Manual later. Uh, Yes. And and what I also did yesterday, no, day before yesterday, was a, a good friend called Luke Gilbertson, who, um, amongst other things, runs an Instagram called Make Green Great Again, did a, a lovely little party at the Bowl Caffeine and Machine up near Bedford, and I went there. And basically, 100 green cars in a car park. What can't be better than that? I mean, nothing. <laughs> what, what can be better than that? Even? Um, coffee and green cars. And there was a guy with a 996 Tiptronic roof, or roof, or whatever they're called, that he sent it to roof, like literally 80 grand, put the, the, the roof engine, the seats, everything, had the car from new in a lovely sort of goldy silver, that special gold, which I don't know what it's called, and has done 145,000 miles in a Tiptronic roof from new. What a cool car. I'll put it on the, I'll put it on the thing. If, if Good. Yeah. Why, the was, why was he allowed there? That doesn't sound very green to me. Well, because he was he was in the non-green element of the car park at the <laughs> back, but he was I think he was invited just because he was a seriously cool dude. Yeah. Um, but yes, you're dead right. He did have a green. He'd done all of the um, dashboard, everything that could be painted green, green. Oh, he did. Well, oh, so inside was done green. Inside was a bit green. I'll send some pictures. But anyway, yeah. uh, as always, a fun week of silly car shit. So no breakdowns, no failures to start. I've Another had a, I've had a roof that won't close. Ah, no. on what? On, on on a Bentley Continental Supersport. Which, wow. Um, I had to uh, drive it in this morning at five a.m. with the roof open. So you do that anyway, though, wouldn't you? But anyway, it was bloody lovely. 5 a.m. The sun's just coming up now, isn't it? 5.30. Oh, it's nice. Nice couple of days. It's a lovely, that's, lovely that's, bloody that's feeling. It's unusual on one of those, isn't it? They're normally bulletproof, those things. I know. I know. Oh. Maybe it's been shot with a bullet. No. <laughs> it will recover. will be positive. It Which will. Be It'll be fine, yeah. Well, because of the unique way in which this podcast is funded, there is a seamless link yeah. I'm going to establish between Bruton, where Neil had a lovely weekend, and Braemar, it's not quite alliterative, but that's not the link. Bruton became Bruton because of the efforts of Hauser and Worth. Yes, exactly. And if you'll know this, and yeah, most of you know this, they are swanky art dealers from Switzerland. I buy all my stuff there. And they had <laughs> bought and renovated a lovely lodge, hunting, shooting lodge in Braemar called the Five Farms. Neil's been there. Mm-hmm. 
not the place to go if stuffed animals taxidermy and general wildlife death isn't your bag. Lots of sort of stag stuffed and everything around the place. Beautiful work. The reason I raise it, because in the Five Farms, there was a stunning whiskey bar. And there were three chaps running it. And I went in there and I said, um, they were talking about cars. And I said, um, I don't know, I want to know more about whiskey. And I said, the kind of question that is always a bit of a cliche is, what's the world's best car? And I was going to say, could you answer what's the world's best whiskey? But before I got there, he said, Toyota GR Yaris is the world's best. I said, well, that's a really interesting answer. Why do you think it is? So he starts showing me loads of different whiskeys. So the first instructional element of my weekend was, what is the Toyota GR Yaris of the whiskey world? Mm. I hear you ask. It's that. Oh. What's that? Uh, Banana Rama. Bunahaven. Bunahaven. Uh, it's not expensively priced. It is. I said, well, how do you describe it before I taste it? He said, it's Jaffa cakes in a bottle. Oh, it's just absolutely lovely. So we had a really interesting discussion about why Petey, because I know you're a big Lagavulin fan, Monkey. Not always. Talk- it's on my list, though. Oh, well, interesting. We talked about it. And I said, why is that so Petey? And we talked about the active ingredient in peat, which is used to cook the barley. And non-peaty tasting scotches use a different, either coal or something else, which is what I Lagavulin, the peat they use for that is 50 parts per million of the active ingredient. Is it fennel or something like that? He then showed me a bottle and let me sm- smell a bottle, which was 250 parts per million of the peat stuff. It was like sticking head in bonfire. So that was yeah. the first part of my lovely car weekend, talking about whiskey. No. The main thing was we hired... We had a five-year-old enterprise car rental. I had a five-year-old BMW 218, three-cylinder, five, 1.5 engine. And we just drove around in the Highland. It was just lovely. Lynn and I were together. And I adopted a completely different approach to driving. I enjoyed the scenery. I enjoyed lovely car, nice steering. That fantastic BMW seating position, you know, where you crank it down on the lever. And then there's that lever at the front, which then tips the whole thing up. So you, it, oh that feeling when you find that lever at the front. So we drove around the Highlands in this 218. It was just lovely. We went um, all the way up to the Lynn of Dee, for those not further up the River Dee, went to Glenshee on Sunday morning. Then we went up the Lecht to Tom and Tull, where I used to go as a kid. Just stunning weather. We were lucky with the weather. It was, and it just told me that you don't have to have all the power in the world. It's got about 130 horsepower, this 218. Mm. But it was nice to drive. We didn't feel in a hurry. So my weekend in cars was tasting a lot of lovely Scotch whiskey, enjoying a 218. The last part of it was on the way back to Aberdeen Airport, we passed a very small service station, probably a very old Ford dealer in the day. And they had a tiny little showroom. And on the way out, I'd noticed it because in the window, they looked like there was one of those. 129, yeah. 129. Um, it looked like it had, from a distance, the colour-coded bumpers pre-facelift early 129. So on the way back on Sunday, I thought, I'll stop. And it's got one of those very old-fashioned price things in the yeah. window where you have all the plastic numbers and the plastic things all a bit rattly. It's all a bit Swiss Tony. And it said £9,000. You can't see yeah. it. It says £9,000. I thought it's probably 320 something like that. Then I took another shot. And I noticed that on the side. Ah, oh. it's an SL six hundred. So I thought a nine grand SL six hundred. So I googled it when I got home, and the service station says nothing about what it's selling. But I did see on Google Maps there was a picture of this car in the pictures in Google Maps from about a year ago when it was thirteen and a half. So if you are the proprietor of the Aboyne service station with your wonderful Gulf Endurance fuels on sale. Do get in touch and tell us the story of your SL600, which has been on sale for a year. How many miles down... on it? I don't know. I couldn't get it. It was all locked. Huh. So that wouldn't, look, that wouldn't make for pretty reading on the Auto Trader price tracker, would it? No, it wouldn't, would it? So I had a lovely weekend in cars. Lovely. Nice. Scotland's well, lovely. We couldn't get more middle class if we tried, could we? This is fantastic. Mm. Uh, Edward Lovett, what have you done? Well, talking about the auto pra- uh, trader price track, we were trying to value yesterday 
a new model Vantage V12, which for some reason they decided to make a limited edition thing, probably so they could put their little Aston Martin tax <laughs> on the top. I think they were three, were they 320,000 yeah. pounds? Yeah. Well, when, and when I was looking, when, when they launched that car and it was limited edition, probably goes down to this percentage rule of how many combustion engines and all that sort of. Chris, you'd probably know more about that. Yeah. But it just didn't make any sense why that would be. They they almost don't need to call it limited edition Aston Martin. They just sell as many as they can, which is probably yeah. less think, than less than three hundred anyway. I think they're both the same thing: limited edition, sell yeah. as many as they can. But yeah. but what what's interesting about that car is, is today. So there, there there's a dealer in the UK looking at auto um, trader price tracker that. Their car is coming up to its birthday on the 26th. It's been in stock for 12 months. It's been reduced £130,000 from its original asking price a year ago. They're now asking, I think, 219950 I think it's still about fifty grand too much money. Wow. 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 That's painful, isn't it? That is. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah. I was it, just, it should I was have been building, 100. I was building a bridge with them as well. I've had some good to and fro with Aston in the last week, but that's completely shafted it. Well, no, no, it, it doesn't have to be because it's still a great car, but I just, there are certain cars yeah, that need it's... to be priced in a certain way. And and I, and I and it sort of discredits the car if they got get carried away. Need, the right customer has to buy the right car for the right reason and price has a lot to do with it. Um, you, you can't just stick a huge price on it because all of a sudden you're trying to attract a, a wholly different customer, yeah. which is the wrong customer. These are wise words. These yeah. are wise they words. They are wise words. What did you do this week with cars? Well, not much, really. My wife went away for the weekend, so she took hmm. the family car. So we took the... Uh, we I had the kids. So we just played around in London in the i3, um, go, going from park to park and restaurant to restaurant and that sort of stuff, the sort of stuff I do in London over the weekend. Apart from we decided to go for some Peking duck on mm. um, <laughs> on uh, on Saturday. On the corner and of Hyde Park. Right, on the corner of Hyde Park, yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm. Um, and rather than driving, I thought we'd take the tube. But so I got to, obviously Hyde Park. I have to change from the district line to the oh, Piccadilly line. So that. I thought I'll really piss my children off, and I'll, I'll get off at Sloane Square. What without and them? I'll be a car spotter, and I'll walk through <laughs> Belgravia. Nice. And the thing I really like about Belgravia is there's some real old school car fans there. And they choose wisely. Mm. There was multiple Mercedes S-Class coupes. There were Continental Ts parked in muses. And then e even the most ordinary of cars, something like a Porsche Cayenne, when you walk up to it, it's not, it's not a Cayenne S, it's a Turbo S. Yeah, and then you look at the wheels, and they didn't—they didn't have the standard steel brakes. They wanted the massive six-pot ceramics, and then there are Phantom street parked with. I just—I uh, thought it was brilliant. Je my son was on my shoulders; he'd given up walking by this stage. Just name it. What's that Porsche, Daddy? What's that Porsche, Daddy? Which one's that one, Daddy? That's the best yeah, weekend. It is, it is yeah. good car. It is good car spotting through there. Great car spotting because it's not obvious. All of it. There's always mm. little, you'll see a little E thirty three two five i cab, probably wow. a billionaire. You, you know, it's always yeah. there's always something cool. Manish, what have you done this week with cars? Well, we are going on a recce to Rome and Bologna this weekend for the Luca film, and um, it's been a week of quite intense research. And the big research, and perhaps the listeners. And viewers can have a think about this. We're trying to sum up Luca's career in road Ferraris. How would you find about half a dozen, perhaps a couple more cars that sum up his brief jaunt in 1973 to 76, and then his 
cards that he is responsible for, not the first stint, obviously, but in the second stint, from the end of 91 to when he leaves in 2014, can you sum that up in six to eight Ferraris? And yeah, that's definitely. in the week. It's been um, it's been so enjoyable. Good fun. Mm. Vetracina. Mm. What what year was a Vetracina? Totally wrong. No, but when what in his first stint? Yeah, but he wasn't no, right, in, in his first stint, he had nothing. Yeah, yeah the first stint, he had nothing at all to do. You've got to start, um, got to start with a, a a pre facelift three four eight. So you can't change gear. You've got to see him swearing as the second gear synchro snags again. Yeah. Uh, then you've probably got to go straight to a 355. Good. That was the one that fixed it. Then I'd probably go, I'd leap forward a bit then. I might even go 458 because I think 458 speciali aperta. Uh, no, actually, no, I'd need one in between that, wouldn't you? You'd need. I you'd... think you might need a 456. Ugh. They were Actually, kind of I'm built sure we've when he arrived. They were built when he arrived, really. Four five six was already done, really, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm sure it's done. important though for somebody. Three sixty was his first car, really. His three, first five, new five, car. three five five was his first car. Well, it was an adaption of the three four eight though, so it was a cheap first car. Three sixty was his all new car. Okay, yeah. take that. Well, I tell you yeah. what, we'll, we'll ruminate on that during this podcast. Yeah. We won't get stumbling now. And uh, you must put a V12 in there as well. As an FF. It's got to have an FF in there. Oh, Absolutely. right, here we go. I've lost yeah. control of the floor already. I've lost yeah. control of the floor. I heard so it look, just one, one little thing. Is just to, I, I was talking to um, Chris and Neil about it before. So we're planning to shoot some cars in Rome and in Bologna. And the Italian bureaucracy about shooting at any of their antique sites, especially if you want to stick a car in front of it, is unbelievable, which is part of the reason why we're doing this recce, where we're spending five days with an amazing Italian fixer going, could we shoot by the Colosseum? And I'm going, no. Could we shoot by the Forum? No. Money we... will fix it all. Exactly. Is it, is it, was it a bit like the scene in The Italian Job, where the bloke walks up the steps and says, well, I think you should all wish yourselves good luck. And then the dodgy Italian guy walks up behind. Is is that? Did you have that dodgy Italian guy following you up the steps? He's always. I think there. You've got another problem. Yeah. The mafia. Yeah. Such a great line. There's a there's a there's a shadow movie we can make about you making him. I think it's good. We should go. Do I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm not sure about driving around Rome. I I, I like driving anywhere. I'd rather be driving than walking anywhere, but Rome might be the exception. You just can't relax, can you? It's just, it comes at you from all sides. You just, you convince yourself, I've got this covered, and then something comes out of nowhere, and you think, well, I, I didn't see that coming. Have you ever done one of those golf buggy tours in Rome? Lynn and I went there for her, for her birthday a few years ago, and uh, the hotel said, the best way of seeing Rome in a day is a golf buggy tour. Nice. And it's literally a golf buggy on the road in the traffic. Because you go down quite narrow street stuff and get to places where you wouldn't otherwise go. The most extraordinary experience of my life, because it's sort of standard golf, but it's not like souped up. It's not like a speciale golf buggy. It's a little golf buggy with all of the structure and integrity and, and protection of a chip bag. It was brilliant. It's a lovely way of seeing Rome, but I didn't see much of it through clenched shut eyes. <laughs> That'd be good. Uh, so uh, everyone's covered. So I, I, I started my week, really, uh, ice driving with the Tuttle Bunch. Uh, I'm not going to bore. Everyone knows what this is about. I don't want to eulogise too much, but it is probably the best thing you can do in a car. It's wonderful. He's my mate. I can't do too much for sales pitch, but last gallon of petrol, it's probably up near Ore or Are, however you pronounce it. Ore. Ore in, uh, in Sweden on a lake driving with your mates it is just fantastic fun reminded me that obviously i'm massively overweight and out of shape because i was totally ruined after about three hours on the ice uh but it really is a fantastic place and also the food's fantastic yeah uh sas scandinavian and airline services stitched us on the way out so we ended up spending six and a half hours in stockholm airport which is not the best airport in the world i have to say uh on the way back there was a fist fight in uh in passports as well so that was that wasn't smooth however the main part of my week, my motoring week, was this. I continue my journey of discovery with the E61 M5. 
every time something happens to the car, it goes wrong, which is on a weekly basis now. I get lovely notes on Instagram from people that own these cars and say, that happened to me as well. That's a common <laughs> fault. I don't know. There should be notice boards around the UK saying these are the common faults of the E61 M5. Anyhow, I was driving down the M5 at a reasonable lick on, when was it, Saturday night or Friday night? Uh, and it was raining hard. And I heard a weird noise on the on the leading edge of my windscreen. And I then saw one wiper, well, they weren't working in parallel. One did this, hit the other one, whacked into the A-pillar, punctured the A-pillar, ripped the trim off it. What? And, and then the wiper decided, with the metal bit, decided to, um, to sort of eject itself over the top of the car, hit the car behind. Sorry, car behind. I did apologise, couldn't do much about it. Uh, and then I was left driving like that, uh, couldn't really do much. And luckily, the rain abated and I could get myself back to base. So I put a, a little video up on Instagram. But of course, I had dozens of people saying, same thing happened to me. It's a very common problem. The bearing fails. I've never had a car that's had its window. Never. No. no. It's, not, it's not great, really. Anyhow. And, it, phys it physically came off? No, the, the arm stayed on. It's It's got the... the it's a, it's a, it's that curious era of BMW, which started with the E39, where they have a left hand, a left hand drive wiper assembly for yeah. right hand drive cars. They didn't want to yeah. spend the money tooling to go the other way, but it's got, it's got two fixture points on the arm that's the side of the driver. Yeah, one of them failed. The other one stayed on. So the arm stayed ah. in. I mean, this is riveting stuff, I know. But <laughs> the bearing failed so comprehensively that the ball races are actually all lying beautifully on the inside where that plastic. Scuttled, comes. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I can buy the part. It's a couple hundred quid. But literally, something goes wrong every single week with that car. I love it more and more. It is sensational. That engine is the best. And I will fix this myself and we'll be going. But touch on ice, ice driving and failed wipers is my week. Does anyone use rain -X? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, in a race car. Not yeah. on a race, not on a road car. No, I've never, I've never, I've never tried it, but I've... Because you basically don't need windscreen wipers, then, do you? Mm, only yeah. when you're... It only works when you're moving. If, you, if you're not moving, it'll still bead. And also... But if Rain you're not moving, it doesn't matter, does it? Yeah, but Rain-X well, Rain collects dirt. That's the problem with rain -X. It, Waxy. And it, it, once the dirt gets in it, you get this sort of weird opaqueness, and then you have to resist the temptation as a racing driver to flick the wiper. If you flick the wiper then, you're done. You're just, That's death. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Okay. I will, it's I best will, for visors on lids. Yeah, it's good for that. And the anti-fog one you put on the, the inside. The anti-fog is essential in, yeah. yeah. Right. You, were you thinking about getting some, Neil, to put on the uh, the roofless Bentley? Uh, no, I just, you know, it was it was a thing that I've never tried, and I've tried most things. <laughs> when, I, when I... Report bought, back, Neil. Have a go. Report back. When I bought the first G-Wagon I had, a friend of mine uh, who deals in such things said, there's a ceramic coating you can put on the windscreen that acts like Rain-X. I'm an yeah, idiot. that that's Bernie Madoff. I knew it was yeah. work. so. That's... I had it put on, and it was impossible to get rid of. And what <laughs> yeah. it did was it made the right the right blade did that. Da, 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 da. It just, oh. <laughs> I just was done. It yeah. instantly aged your wipers by ten years. Yeah, yeah. Leave, we, leave leave windscreen alone and use squeezy, as my mother used to say. We need a <laughs> conversation about ceramic coatings. Oh, <laughs> I you know saw what? you coming. I'm an advocate that my yellow car has lasted well. Our next topic this week, <laughs> proposed by Neil Clifford, this is good. What or who is your favourite TV sleuth? Mm -hmm. And if they were alive today, what would they drive? Uh, Edward Lovett, do you even have a favourite TV sleuth? You don't strike... I, I, I'm TV. glad you asked me that question, because I, I don't think I do. It's not really my... Uh, it, well, I, I say it's not my jam, and then I started having a little poke around. But I couldn't really find any that I love that what they drive. The, I've got the, one for you. You what? The, keep one, going, keep one, going. one that you like. Well, There's the one that you like them. as well. There's There's well, there are there are there are loads of them, but they're not the sort of the when I when I think sleuth, it's not really my era. There are sleuths for all eras, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I, uh, let, let, let's come back to me, Christopher. But I, I've written some down, but they were a bit Don't of a... Don't bloody list a all of them, punt. for Christ's sake. We want to do ours. Well, I want to... Actually, the one I quite, I quite... I thought this is sort of typical of what I think a sleuth would be driving, which is the latest Luther. And I don't know if you've watched Luther, but it's very yeah. good. And yeah. he drives a shitty old Saab. That's kind of... You know, he's legit. He's doing... Yeah. He's focused on his job. 
Or is he trying a bit too hard with the shitty old side? Was it? No, I don't think that's hard? the point. He's not trying. He doesn't want to think about his car. He, he it's under a cover somewhere. Yeah, you, and, uh... you wouldn't end up with those if you weren't thinking about cars. <laughs> By the way, can we agree that there's that episode of Luther which starts in a woman's bedroom, and it's all quiet. She's asleep, and you see a leg come out from underneath the bed. It is the most horrific scene. I'm, I, I, I remember thinking, I can't watch this. Go and watch that episode where whose leg guy, was it? Some bloke, or... some bloke who's hiding, who's up to no good, hiding under her bed and emerges. It's everyone's ultimate nightmare. The way yeah. they shoot the scene is so powerful. <gasps> Sorry, thinking about it now makes me shake. Um, so what I what what, what I actually the, the the one car I was trying to think what would be the modern interpretation is a white Testarossa. What if you drove a white Testarossa back in the day? What would you drive today? That's a good question. Uh, and I, I, I thought it would pr probably be in today. A Maserati, a Maserati MC20. Or some kind That's of That's not a bad call. That's not it's a bad a, yeah. call. Yeah. Something mid engined a bit out mm. there. Mm. Okay. So, Edward, I should yeah. have checked you first. It's a lovely little chat we've had there, but uh, <laughs> you've not really bought it into the sleuth thing. So, I'm going to go straight to Manish, who I think is a bit more sleuthy. Well, I, I think the best sleuth ever, in my opinion, was Colombo. I mean, by absolute. Ah. He's just, um, did Definitely. you know, when he, when Peter Falk at his absolute peak was the highest paid actor in anything, anywhere, he was paid $350,000 an episode at that show's peak in the 70s. That's just scary money, if you think about it. But you've been in TV, you know what people learn. I mean, can you just imagine earning that kind of money in the kind of mid to late 70s. Now, if you watch any of the early ones, um, Steven Spielberg, when he was 19, directed as one particular episode to really? set up in, I think, I can't remember, it was, um, it's certainly on the coast in California. It's fantastic, handheld cameras, tension like you couldn't believe. I mean, that show is scripted to a point of absolute genius. I mean, imagine two people sitting down and going, we've got this idea, we'll show you a murder. And we'll show you exactly how clever the murderer is and what the murderer does. And then we'll get this bumbling fool to come along and meet the murderer. And some instinct is going to tell him that's the murderer. And for the next hour, it's all about the tension between the two of them. It's yeah. like an arm assault. And this little man in his, in, in his coat is going to win. And by the way, did you know that the coat had the jacket and the shirt all, they were basically tailored. They're, he wasn't wearing a shirt, a jacket and a coat. The whole thing was just something, you know, you, otherwise he'd be so hot. Can you imagine what that set would have been like? So he used to have, I don't know if you remember, he had a, it was either a Basset Hound or a... a it was a Basset Hound. I think he did, yeah. and, and he had the a Bingo 503, um, and it was a convertible, and it was patty as hell. Yeah. And it was pretty, because, you know, he'd often, a lot of these murders were committed by the rich or or whatever, the good, the great and the good of Beverly Hills. And he would drive. It was fantastic. It was like, do you remember Fraser's father had that really annoying seat right in the middle yeah. of his? It, it, this car was just like that. It just offended the kind of rich millionaire, you know, who who committed the perfect murder. And this guy would just, he was so offensive. And I was thinking, what could you possibly have today that would, piss off uh, if you you, you we, we bought colombo to the uk to belgravia edward and <laughs> there are murders in belgravia so we just basically do colombo again but there's always a kind of murder it's either in belgravia or it's in kensington or it's in chelsea or it's in wherever that place is in uh in norfolk you know which is the chelsea on sea um or I think it would have to be Del Boy's Reliant Robin. I think that is... Ah, good. That's brilliant. <laughs> have you <laughs> seen... Um, have you seen, um, Slow Horses, Gary Oldman? Yes, yes. The car he's got in that. I mean, I think that's, there's a lot of Columbo being channeled there, and he's just Horse, really yes, brilliant. Yes. But he's got a rather shitty old yellow Honda Civic or whatever yeah. it is. It's uh, which he's clearly flatulated in constantly. The fabric of the car is collapsing through gaseous poisoning. It's just it's that kind of thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Chris's M5 touring with its tow hook <laughs> um, cover out on the front and a and a track day number on the back that could do it as well. So critical, Edward. It's a used car, a used vehicle. <laughs> um, okay, I, I'm on with that. Uh, Chris Cooper, who's your favourite sleuth, and what would they drive now? Well, it's got to be it's got to be Dempsey and Makepeace, hasn't it? Sure. Mm. Good. Well, or as I used to think when I was young, younger, make peace in me. She, she was. She still <laughs> was. She's, she's still beautiful. And she is. Still, she's lovely. They're still married. They are still married. Yeah, Bra uh, Brandon. What's his name? And Glynis Barbie. Yeah, very happily. Literally lived happily. Uh, are living happily ever after. What did she drive in that series, though? Uh, she did, it wasn't an XR three. It was a one point six i. Well done. Yes. It's well done. Early. It was a one. It was the XR3 lookalike convertible, but it was a 1.6i. Do you know why it wasn't called an XR3? Uh, no, you've it, got me there. It didn't have an XR3 engine. It was oh. even. Yeah, it was like the Gen 2 Mark III Ford Escort was an XR3 because it had a bit more power in it. Yeah, yeah. So I think today, I think uh, make peace. In my world, she and um, Dempsey. Who? What did Dempsey drive? Anyone SL, remember? Uh, SL five hundred. It was. It probably wasn't an SL five hundred because it was an SL early one hundred seven, three fifty something like three eighty. I think three fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three eighty. Um, so I think now she'd be a consulting crime sleuth mm. of considerable means. So I think she'd have a DB twelve convertible. Uh. That's what I think she'd have. <clears throat> yeah, she, and yeah. I'd be happy. She was uh, an out-and-out -out rocket. It's the only word I can use to describe yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Neil Clifford. Well, I, I've got two only because if I didn't go first, I knew someone would have Columbo. Because Columbo is, Columbo is my favourite. And just as a reference on Columbo, my decision on his car was a 205 CTI Roland Garros. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Just to maintain um, the French what color? convertible thing. Green. What color? I think they were only in green. They yeah. were. Yeah. They were. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my my plan B was, do you remember Hazel? Yes. Now, oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a super niche British, sort of slightly minder-ish, but not as successful as a TV no. program. But he was a very good-looking chap, basically. His name was James Hazel. Um, because I was going to go shoestring as well, but and there's also the guy with the polio, I couldn't remember his name, or maybe that was shoestring. Anyway, I'm back to Hazel. Yeah, he had a Triumph Stag. Yes, Ooh. oh, oh no, Triumph oh, bloke, Triumph Stag, exactly. So I'm thinking, what, what, what is as shit as a Triumph Stag, but a little bit more modern. So it's got to be British. So I went TVR, but then you've got to do the, almost the worst TVR because most TVRs are quite good. They are. But then there was that, what was it, TVR S? That was a good one. Was it? That was the first yeah. of the Peter yeah. Wheeler era. The yeah. first yeah. of the Peter Wheeler, and there was a V8 one, wasn't there? Yeah, I, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I, because the Stag was V8. Three litre right. V8. Yeah, three. So it's a little V8. So I've gone TVRS, but the V8 with the bonnet bulge. Um, and and I think Hazel Part Two would probably be just screaming around in that because a Triumph Stag, apart from the overheating, Triumph Stag's quite cool actually. I think it's quite a pretty car. Yes, it is. It's just a shit car, but it's pretty. And I think maybe <laughs> the TVRS V8 is probably in that genre. Pretty and shit. Didn't the Trump stag have record tiny uh, oil change uh, routine? It <laughs> oil change like every you, like the two thousand miles. You drove it away from the garage and drove it straight back. Needed. Oil change. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But they had some good colours in Trump stags. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah. good colours and a nice dashboard. And the blue was nice. And it would. Do you know what? That would be one of my guilty pleasures. I think it's a great looking car. I yeah, love it is. The yeah. Look. With the but tin they, roof for the image. Mm. Mm, you know, okay. um, in the, when when Hammer was starting to really run out of money and recycling their Dracula films, they made a, I highly recommend it, a film called Dracula AD 1972. Yes. When, you, you remember this? Caroline Monroe yes. was in it. Stephanie yes. Beach. Here. And what they do is you've got all these 30-year-olds pretending to be 19, which I have no problem with at all. 
And uh, there are a bunch of groovy kids who live in Chelsea who bring Dracula back. And the baddie amongst them is a guy called Johnny Alucard. And if you spell Alucard backwards, it's Dracula, the disciple. And he's this sort of rich, <laughs> rich Chelsea living Etonian who has tickets for, you know, Ooh. all jazz concerts. And he actually shags Marsha Hunt in this as well. But oh, Johnny good to know. Alucard... In the shag, or, or, or in the Triumph shag or not? <laughs> no, <laughs> in, in his flat. But he... He's got, and he's got a flat with a mezzanine and one of those showers with an outdoor view. I mean, it's incredible. But he has a Triumph stag. Yeah. That is Johnny Alucard's car. Yeah. Oh. Look at the front end on that. I have to it's say, good it's good. The good grill and the front end on that. Yeah. It's, good car. it's, it's a good car. Yeah. Good we should car. buy one. No. Yeah, the, and the wheels, those, the, really those, those alloy wheels, yeah. they were... Uh, in my book, they're just behind the GKN Kent alloys on the XJ. They stand. It'll be alloy. worth more than an Aston Martin Vantage yeah. V12 at some point. <laughs> who'd, have, soon. They're who'd, curved. Have, who'd have thunk that we would be the Triumph Stag Appreciation Society? I thought we'd be spitting on that thing, but we are celebrating it. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're all wrong about the sleuth. The greatest ever is Morse, obviously. Uh, and um, I love Morse. I don't have any memories, people know, but I can remember just about every word of every Morse. Mm. Uh, the car was very, very um, particular. So it was a the story behind it was that it they got the wrong car, it's got the wrong roof, it's got everything's wrong about it, but they stuck with it. Uh, John Thor hated driving the bloody thing because it wouldn't work. It was a pain in the ass. I've driven the actual car. They fixed it now. It's rather lovely. It lives in storage. Never gets used. I think it's owned by an Australian gentleman. Um, so what would a modern Mark II Jag be? And more importantly, what, what were the reasons for, for Colin Dexter giving him this car? Well, it was it was it's because he's a curmudgeon, he doesn't want to be modern. So he wants to be, he wants to he wants to use his car to demonstrate his displeasure with modern society. Uh, a pretty basic TV theme, I have to admit for a sleuth. So, but there isn't really an equivalent now. There's nothing that's 20, 30 years old that we can celebrate as being British, I don't think. You can't go for a sports car, it has to be a saloon car. So I think Morse has happened across a few quid. He was left a few quid by a rich aunt, and he's bought a Bristol fighter. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because it's British, and he can sit in there, he can play his, his, he can play the Valkyrie and whinge about modern society and how he hates Vivaldi for some reason, uh, and he can do his crosswords from the comfort of a Bristol fighter, which might work now and again. And if he does break down, he can find Neil, find Neil Clifford because he knows all about them. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> Itches that need scratching. Not a dermatological conundrum, a car conundrum. So, uh, Chris Cooper, and I can say this a straight face, what's your itch and how many scratches? I've got loads. That's the problem. If I, if they really were itches, I'd look like that bloke from The Singing Detective. Mm. Just by the end of the thing, you just have. Um, I had loads written down. Um, some of them Finley and Cameron gave me, which I suddenly realised weren't my itches. They were their itches to be scratched. So things like, yes, I noted, so boys, yes, McLaren 765, yes, very good, well done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I will scratch that itch at some point. Three, two, BMW 325 convertible. Somebody mentioned it earlier, and I just thought, well, that is definitely an itch. Yeah, they're good. Definitely an itch. And I've got quite close a couple of times. There was one that, um, what's the garage? Is it Nutley Garage? Nutley, Nutley. yeah. They have yeah. good cars, yeah. And a, a few years ago, they had one of they had JK's three two five convertible, grey with red, grey with red. I know the car, yeah. Yeah, and it went for <laughs> highly reasonable sum of money. So if anybody's got that Mars. and wants an entirely reasonable sum of money for it, please do get in touch. That is one itch I would someone, like. Someone who bought their itch to scratch convertible, which was a W one two. Or whatever you call it. No, it's not a W, is it? It's a 124 320 Sportline convertible. I bought one of those. Everyone that wants to buy one of those should buy the car Chris is talking about, the E30 convertible. It's just as big, much more reliable, and much cooler, I think. I've nicer got... engine. Nicer engine. My, nicer my, engine. Con my convertible four seat Benz never gets used because it's never working. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I scratch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Manish, what would you like to scratch in regards to an inch? Actually, I am organising for this to happen at the end of this week. But my, uh, no, 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 
four, five, six is much bigger than an itch. That feels more like some transplant surgery, nice. frankly. It's essential. I'm going to die in that. It's of different proportion. <laughs> Porsche Boxster. Exactly. No, no, no. And it, um, Mr. Renault Cooper, Alpine. When Mr. Cooper gets a moment, he's going to he's going to have a quick look in. What what was the garage number again? It was one. Uh, it's Hangar 136. Hangar 136 has got yeah. the car in it. I know it's an automatic, but I've just decided it's so beautiful. I should buy it. Provided yes. it doesn't fall apart. But that's Agreed. not the itch. The itch is my now my Audi A4 Avant is uh, 17 this year. I just hit 40,000 miles of it doing a short, <laughs> short <laughs> errand last week, and I just decided. Honestly, it's it, the only frustrating thing is in London. People are very rude about parking, so it's got quite a few parking scratches on every little corner. So I'm going to drop it into a body shop and I'm going to have all the scratches polished out so the car looks absolutely brand new. And one of the alloys, one of the alloys has got a little, and that that was my fault. I know, Ooh. I can't look at it. So no. I'm going to spend, I'm going to spend a, a couple of thousand pounds on a car that's worth, I think five, <laughs> making it look good. That is the itch I'm going to scratch. And I'm going to scratch it this week. Just get chips away to pop around. Oh, can, they they can't. Can they do all four corners? And... Depends, it depends how bad it is, Manish. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've people got the man for you, Manish. And they crap drivers. That's the. Uh... Neil will send someone around I've, 500 I've got... quid cash. I've I've like, got... I like that. I like renewing and replenishing at the moment. I'm doing I this. Am, I'm renewing it. I like it. Renew and replenish. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels like a new car. You know, put new damage, yeah. put new wiper blades on the car. It feels like a new car. Yeah. Um, Ed would love it. Uh, what are you gonna? Uh, what are you gonna scratch? Do, did we do what? What did we do a few weeks ago where you talked about doing Le Mans? Bucket was list. That, bucket list. That was, bucket, that was bucket list. Okay, fine. Um, it's similar. You're right. No, that's no, fine. But I, I, my cars that I have in in London. Um, I've either got two seats or four seats, but there's nothing really fun with four seats. So I need, I need, I might, might be three, two, five um, convertible. We might all be looking for one of those soon. Yeah. Or still, that Bentley itch needs scratching. So Neil, Neil, I could borrow Neil's with its broken roof and it okay. sort of send it back with a fixed roof. But some, some sort of four seater family convertible cabriolet solution is probably something that needs itching for this summer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to those. Yeah. That, I, and I'm not sure what it should be. What What would you have today? Well, that's a good question. Um, Let, let's, let's set a budget. Let's sub sub £60,000. Okay, I've got just the answer. I think Saloon. it would be... Uh, um, no, no, convert, four-seater yeah. convertible. The current eight BMW eight series eight fifty mm. non not the M eight one but the eight fifty yeah. M M eight fifty M cab you could get in that price range. Um, you could also get a, an S five sixty Merc. I quite like them. I just remind me at the weekend when I drove this little BMW. Those seats, the way those seats work. It's yeah, just, good. Mm. Yeah. So you've got some good choice in there. You'd buy an 8 Series, and the first time you saw someone in an S63 cab, you'd go, balls, I got that wrong. Yeah, yeah but not for his budget. <laughs> you just would. Yeah, you would. you get one for 60 grand. No, you get black wheels, and it would look a bit slightly abused, and people would say, oh, dear. Look, he's got his children in there as well. Everything can be painted. Um, I, might and, I might go and fly a Belgravia, see if I can pick myself up one of those that was sort of dotted on the streets that never gets used. Um, Neil Clifford, how do we ask you what itch you haven't scratched? Because your your list of car ownership is uh, profound, say the least. So I've, got, I've still got a better list than Manish. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, I've no, what? I've had eczema actually genuinely from a kid. So I can name oil of eulatum, betnovate, epiderm. E45. I've had all the, eight, I've, yeah, I've had all the creams and I've still got the itches. Um, and if I'm going to name one, and the, you know, they are constant, it is actually TVR. I've never yeah. had the TVR. I, I'd, I'd love a TVR Griffith. I think, you know, that is an itch that I do have. I would, yeah. I would have. 
I have to admit that, Governor. I think it's a great itch. I think yeah. you won't, won't be. You you would be the sense of relief and lingering satisfaction from the salving ointment to your soul that Griffith would be. I think it's an itch that probably doesn't last that long because you know they're probably not as good as you want them to be <laughs> i've got this lovely little 10 grand box though which genuinely is just immensely fantastic it's 95 percent of a 300 grand speedster you know man maths are out the window because it's just it's just a fantastic car it's a bit like the Al the Al alpina i've come late to an alpina and a boxster and they're fantastic fantastic cars 10 grand on a boxer is all you need to have car pleasure. Yeah. You should go and drive a brand new one and see what you think about a 100 grand bo boxer versus a 10 grand boxer. Do you think they are just dirt? You think that 90,000 pounds is on the flattest part of the curve? Yeah, no, it honestly, it's, it's got the career of the, 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 the first series boxers, even got the career of GT font. Really? Yeah, on the, on the dials. It's wow. just immensely good. I'm yeah. so. Everything else is, is you know, diminishing returns. It's a bit like hi-fi or watches or clothes or shoes. I suppose any consumer goods, really. There's a, there's a, there's a sweet spot where it does 90% of everything for like 10% of the cost. And the box there is that. All of the Porsche centres uh, throughout the UK, and I don't know if they've done this as sort of a worldwide initiative, um, got their workshops to convert boxes yes. into racing cars, and then they yeah. had someone from the the um, I think one of the technicians um, became a racing driver, and they've yeah. been doing a racing series, which it's is a brilliant, brilliant way. And, they, and they're doing the same with the KN as well. Brilliant, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was clever. Yeah. So, so um, I, did, I did with, answer my question. Yeah, TV yeah. question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of with Neil on how you should answer this. It should be something you've never owned before. And if I write down my list of brands that I've that I've not owned, there's one obvious gap for me. It's the best sounding car name of them all, it's Maserati. I've never owned a Maserati. Mm. And I, I I'm not sure. Jeremy always said to me, you can't say you're a true car fan as you've been out for a Mayo. I think it should be Maserati. I think mm. it's the greatest sounding car name. So what would I have? Most of the sports cars are rubbish, uh, but I do think the the open top. Four seat thing is rather lovely. Grand um, Turismo, Grand, yeah, Grand Cabrio, Grand Cabrio. Yeah, but, but, sorry. but it would have to be a Quattroporte S because I just think it's yeah. the original Quattroporte. It's the coolest car they've made in the last thirty years, and that S one actually did go quite well. It sounded, yeah. good, but but it went quite well. And they're about thirty thousand pounds. I think they're gorgeous. I've yeah, got, I've got no need for the car whatsoever. Sorry, when you say that, that you mean the the um the. 2010 era car. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it ended then, didn't it? So it'd be yeah. about an 809 car, probably. But yeah. with the with the with the ZF automatic gearbox. Yeah, and, yes. and the and the stiff suspension that ruins the ride. But they just yeah. look, they look fantastic. Great cars. Yeah. And I have to own a Maserati one day. I've never owned one. I've seen them under 20. Those mm -hmm. S ones are a bit more. 4.7 with the yeah. with the gap with the gearbox. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great choice. I've now got two itches. <laughs> uh right. I mean, I've got about ten of them. Yeah, the, the, the itch defines one searching when you're in bed before you go to sleep, doesn't it? That's that's what yeah. you're yeah. yeah. Okay. Home servicing. Hmm. Will it end soon? It has to, doesn't it? I mean I I I can't see how the EU will allow you to tamper with your own car soon. Everything's sealed, isn't it? I saw a video the other day. You can't actually Put oil into a McLaren 720s without actually getting a spanner out. You can't. You can't. You can't pop a lid. You have to take a spanner out to take a grill off to put oil into it. Shit. So, yeah, it, it's a it's a funny old world, isn't it? Neil Clifford, what do you think? You like a tinker, don't you? Well, this this came in, into my mind because of the visit to the Haynes Museum and seeing you know the amount of money this guy made, frankly, on those incredible books that we all owned, you know, or, or a mate lent you one, an oily version of it in <laughs> the early 80s to do your tappets or whatever shit you were attempting to do, which you then fucked. That was advanced. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and my first job was in the Fiat garage in Portsmouth on the YTS scheme, and I always remember those oily -o Fiat cans of oil and filters that 
probably 10 times a day, a guy would come in and buy an oil and filter and go back to his house and just service his car, right? Set of spark plugs. It was normal, wasn't it? I yeah, just yeah. don't I just don't think that happens at all anymore. I mean, we were always in Halfords buying filler, sandpaper, because you'd obviously reversed your Mark One Escort into a lamppost or something down the fair or some shit that happened. And you'd re- used to repair it yourself. And you'd buy the spray cans. You know, clearly I'm very old, but no, I don't think any of that happens anymore. And it's a, it's it's sad that it doesn't. Neil's coming to North London to do your car this yeah. afternoon, <laughs> 250 quid cash. <laughs> you know, in Halfords, a third of the bloody shop 20 years ago was oil filters and, you know, air filters. And yeah. I'm sure it doesn't Parts. even exist in Halfords yeah. anymore, does it? No, it's just Garmin stuff and other GPS and... Yeah. Yeah. The and it's like, I mean, of the how many... How many places can you find now that their hourly rate is less than a hundred quid i mean garages are totally taking the piss aren't they yeah yeah we had neil you and i had that conversation the other day about a a garage that we both know where the pre-vat labor rate is 130 pounds an hour so basically you're paying ink ink vat for a sort of a day 1200 quid a day yeah i think it's ridiculous so that's six times the junior doctor salary yeah. Go get your go get your Chiron service. See what they charge you an hour for that. Yeah, I can imagine that. That's so. all the doctors driving those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I, as I was growing up, my father, I, I, I did, I did the whole cycle through the uh, the, the car dealership, working in every department. And my father said, "I knew you, you must be able to service your." I, I used to be able to service my my mini when I was growing up and I don't think I was ever brave enough to tell him what I was thinking but I just wanted to go outside and pop the bonnet on whatever demonstrator I was uh, driving at the time saying right go and fucking service that go figure that out Peter (laughs) 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 they're they're just you can't as as Chris said you know it, it well, with a McLaren where you have to unscrew something to put oil in it, you know, m- most, you know, go into the back of a 911 now and try and figure out it's all just plastic covers. Even a, even a small little area of a 911 engine, you can't, there's nowhere to get your hands in there. And the, yeah. the, and the front engine cars, I think, are, are even worse. It's just all yeah. made to look pretty. I think mm. the, cars, the cars have changed. I mean, it's, it's obvious, the technology is I was thinking when I was at, in Portsmouth at the Polytechnic, and we had a motor club and we had a garage in one of the lockups at Summerlin University. So we had a garage that had the Polytechnic Motor Club auto test car that was always in at least six large pieces. Hmm. Welding kit, really nice set of spanners, <clears throat> which actually most people mostly hadn't been nicked. <clears throat> and we'd have stuff for doing the distributor points gap. We, people would know what the gap should be in distributor points because it yeah. had a distributor. And we'd know what the gap should be, what the t- you know, timing. We'd have a little timing light. Yes. So you could look at the sort of the marks on the the uh, flywheel to see whether the timing was right. Um, cars don't need that these days. I mean, I, my father recently died, and when I sort of looked through, I need to go back. We need to finish, finish the process, really. But I looked at some of the photographs he had out and about. Um of me when I was younger and a lot of them, I'm wearing a boiler suit and it's got oil and stuff on it. I mean, cause I was trying to fix my mini um, minis these days don't need that kind of fixing. So I think the, the need, the art, the experience, it's, it's slowly fading away. And I, I feel sort of embarrassed now that, you know, cause we've got a Mikey on the farm. And if I think, hang on, I quite like an oil change in my defender. I could probably do that. Uh, I could phone find the parts, but I think, what would I do with the oil? I need a Mikey to dispose of the oil because the days of probably somebody chucking it out the back of the garden somewhere. Or, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> funny enough, you can't do that anymore, which is probably entirely correct. So, yeah, I think it's... It's over, isn't it? It's That's sort of... One, of, one of the joys of going to yeah. a historic motorsport is seeing them 
prepare and tinker with the cars that's um, true it, we, we you know with with a handful of tools you know there, there's no computers there when chris no. and i went out to chicago last year and they were running a hack and an f1 car i don't know what era of laptop they were on chris to fire it up do you, you remember i was thinking yeah. what what happens when that laptop stops working does the yeah. car stop working basically yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. basically uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I, this, this was brought into uh, sharp focus for me a few weeks ago when the battery or suspected battery problem with my yellow 911. So I would have, I'm not great at servicing cars. I'd normally choose to take them somewhere else for someone that's good at it. I used to be able to service my Mini and my Peugeots back in the day, but that's a long time ago. But I would have thought that the extent of my maintenance would be put, replacing a battery in a car. If you've got a few cars, it's the most common thing you do. It's a triple true. charger clip comes off. It doesn't work. You go and buy another battery. You can't do that on a 991. I know I was told you have to go. And, the battery has to be coded to the car. <sighs> so unless the battery can talk to the car, the car won't acknowledge the battery. So if you've got a dead battery in your 991 GT3, you can't just go to Halfords and get another one. You've got to go to the port center and then they've got to code it to make it work. So it, even even the battery's kind of been infiltrated by technology. It's quite wow. strange. And it's, not, it's not a whinge as much for me. It's just, it's, I feel lucky that I was never that great a tinkerer. So I've not had an avenue of pleasure denied me. But if you were a real tinkerer, and let's face it, people that bought TVRs when I started doing this for a living, they loved the cars breaking down because it gave them shit to do. That's what they want. There was a masochism to it that, that we all loved. You know, they, if, if the thing ran faultlessly for a couple of months, they'd be utterly pissed off. <laughs> they can get underneath it and swear and you know and and you know take some guards off whatever they're doing but but actually i think for me i, I was never that great a spanner so no. I, haven't, I haven't really lost anything but but i was amazed that a modern car can't you can't just buy a battery i, I thought that was incredible really. i was i was totally unaware of that I was, i've got just I something know. i would say just by analogy just um this idea that you buy something from someone and there's literally nothing that you can do to it without that someone's permission and without that someone maybe doing it. Um, five years ago, these these Apple laptops used to have um, these rubbery feet that went through a hole into the base of the chassis. And they had a kind of, you know, they, they, they'd expand out and they were quite notorious for falling out. And when they fell out, you couldn't just shove them back in. You need a tool. You need a tool. Yeah. It, it, well, no. Get there. So I, it's just an, an I, I phoned Apple and said, oh, "Look, I've had this computer now for seven months. You know, this thing has fallen out. I can't get it back into. No, oh, just take it to the Genius Bar. They'll do it for you." So I went to the Genius Bar, and the guy went away with it. He looked like something the Reverend Moon had created. This guy. He came back and he said, uh, "No, the only way to do it, we have to actually take the computer apart." lift out the PCB and then we can put it in. And I said, what? And he said, I'll be 100 and, 125 pounds. And I said, this thing's worth about 2p. And I was told to come here. And he said, well, you were given incorrect advice, sir. We need to take the computer apart to be able to put this back in. And I said, look, can we just have a common sense conversation here? Do you not think that's ridiculous? And he said to me straight up, he said, are you asking me to criticise the people I work for, sir? <laughs> That's quite a good answer. Yeah. I ran out of there and I went to home base and they've got those little rubber cork sticky things. And I, do you know what, yeah. for 2P, I found, the, I, I remember thinking then, my God, you know, talk about handing over complete, I used to build little computers um, when I was doing yeah, no. we, we all used to do that. We used to get did they work? No, no, no. Yeah, Clever yeah. people like you did. We didn't. We used to run it. No, we did. So I mean, you know, at the time when the acorn atom was a big thing. You'd, I mean, obviously you I was the fire engine in the playground. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, you know, a friend of mine, maybe you know, you'd you buy these printed circuit boards, you'd whack on the processor, you'd get the memory, you do all your stuff, and it, you know, they kind of work, they kind of wouldn't work. We all learned assembly like and this guy was going to try to charge me 125 quid. To I was doing to Swedish on. Muppet Swedish chef impersonations in the language lab. Yeah. I wasn't learning about. Gosh, that's quite clever, Manish. 
I was I mean, chucking it, stones at Parky on my grifter. We were we were real nerds. I wrote some of I thought the finest video games of the eighties that I never sold. I mean, but, yeah, oh, horror, better than Horace Go Skin. <laughs> There was one called Meteor Run, which was a cross between Space Invaders and Galaxians. You had a spaceship, Galaxia. and it could drop down Good. left, right, and the meteors were coming at you like this. <laughs> you could either dodge them or shoot them. Yeah. And the game wasn't quick. We, we all learned assembly language, not because we wanted to program, you know, Elon Musk space. We did it just because so, our video games would be faster. That's the only reason to learn it. Galaxian, so wow. that's a great game. <clears throat> back in the day, back in the day. Was that a ZX81 or a ZX Spectrum or a BBC Micro? No, I learned on a ZX80. My 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 physics teacher, Mr. Trebello, bought one for £200, had 1K of memory. So it was a predecessor. But no, most of it was on the BBC Model B. Yeah. Wow. With the tape recorder machine. On the we side. had a tape recorder. No but tapes. Yeah. I got bought a little floppy drive. It was amazing. Yeah. It changed my life. If you had control of the UK Motorway Signs Network for a day, what would you put on it? No Clifford. I would write, please stop picking your nose. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that would be hilarious, wouldn't it? Because, you know, it is the place you pick your nose, the car. I know this rather controversial thing to say. But if you are going to pick your nose, that's the way you car, do it. The car yeah. is the safest place. Yep. Yeah. So I think that would be quite jolly if you did that and then film all the male reactions. Because I don't think women really pick their nose. It's a male thing, isn't it? Yeah. That's a good point. I'm not seeing a woman pick her nose. <laughs> it's a really good observation. Yeah. They blow it. They women do it are properly. generally just more decent, aren't they? I think yeah. we yeah. We, are, we tend to pick more than blow. I, think. Okay. I was telling my daughter off this, uh, the weekend for picking a nose. She said, Daddy, I'm not picking a nose. I'm just getting a bogey out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She's right. She's right. Uh, Chris Cooper, what would you write on the sign? <laughs> so I would write... When those signs say incident ahead, report of debris, report of pedestrians, report of something or other, I would write, sorry, we made it up. <laughs> Who's ever seen, you know, report of whatever it is, you think it's never there. I was on, I was on one of those speed awareness courses because they had this thing about, you know, Oh, did you slow down for this? I said, there's never anything there. It was a speed awareness course where I, when they said, well, why why did you speed? And everyone's giving erudite answers about different. I said, because it's fun. Um, oh, so you can't say that. I, well, you can. It's true. <laughs> I did say it was because it's truth. fun. And they said, they said, that's the best answer we've ever had. So I, every time I go on a speed awareness course now, that's what the answer I give. Um, so I, I, I would have a bit of honesty, a bit of honesty. Um, it's not speed kills. Speed doesn't kill. It's stopping suddenly that kills. So you'd yeah. say, pay attention, you lazy bastards. Brake better. Yeah. Pay attention, That's, yeah. Yeah, pay attention. And um, I, I'd yeah. find some way of some sort of, because the technology exists to have number plate recognition. And the next sign down, it would have all the number plates of the lazy so-and-so's were stuck in the middle lane. I think that's good. Yeah. They've started and saying have... that now, haven't they? Don't hog the middle lane. Yeah, which everyone does. So, yeah. I've sort of, however, mo however many lanes you put on a motorway, it's only the outer two lanes that ever get used. Which I think is, if I if I ruled the world, but one of the questions the boys have suggested for what we discussed, which we'll discuss another time, is if you could build a new motorway, where would you build it? Mm. Be. Um, so I would have a bit of honesty on the signs. And I say, and I think I'd also have somewhere on that some recognition to say, um, that Chris Cooper, he's driving really well today. Talking of which, <laughs> at the weekend, talking of which the weekend, one thing I noticed in the Highlands, we talked about is we had a motorsport UK dinner at board dinner last night, and we talked about whether driving standards have got better or worse, generally, hmm. just about what regulation and low traffic networks and blah blah blah. In Scotland the weekend, I thought the driving standards were really good. 
really good. And what People, was the, what was the sign of that? The sign. It's a good. It's a good question. So yeah. courtesy, courtesy, anticipation, awareness. So passing places. You know, you know, you and I both live in country lanes where the single track. Everybody thinks they own the lane. They'll go past a passing space. You know, you and I, we'd always end up reversing. It's gotten everybody saw a passing space. They waited. Uh, I saw an Alpine being driven really beautifully, not stupid fast, but nicely fast on the road over the lech down towards Tom and Tall. A really nice Alpine. It had, it was, a, it wasn't one of the R's, but it had like a two tone bonnet. It didn't have the wing, but it was really, so if that was you on Sunday on the road from the lech to Tom and Tall, I salute you, sir or madam. So yeah, I would have a bit honestly on motorway signs. Chris Cooper, you're driving well today. Is one of the best shouts we've ever had on the podcast. Yeah, I would like to see more of that. Yeah, Ed would love it. What would you type? Uh, list for free, sell for free, hassle free, collecting cards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not wrong enough. Because you've got the full, I, I actually wrote down what Chris pretty much said there. So because you've got a lot of the motorways have the full gantry across the uh, the, inter, yeah. the all lanes now. I think some sort of rating of the driver, so a thumbs up or a thumbs down for your speed, your um, lane discipline, whether you have cheese and onion crisps in the car, that clearly gets a thumb down. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what your sweetie of choice is, that gets a thumbs up. Yeah, so just a, a rating system for how the um, algorithm is is judging your driving. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and then some very abusive language for, for poor driving. Manage, what would you type? Well, I, I, I love this idea of the, the digital gantry. I don't know if any of you know, uh, I give you a little anatomical term. You probably all do know the colloquial expression. Glans penis, glans yeah. penis, dickhead. Okay. <laughs> and the bottom line is, I would like, I would like a digital glans penis over the middle lane with automatic number plate recognition for everyone who sits in it for life. Yeah. You just go through, you see a massive penis, and there's your registration plate underneath. <laughs> Do it again, there's another one. And you just keep doing it until the guys use the lane properly. Mm. There is um I was discussing this last week, actually. That in one of the European countries, is it France or Spain? They do have big signs that put up your number plate if you're speeding. And so you, actually, you're, you're going to get a ticket as well. But they, they, there's a sort of public shaming thing where they put it up. Uh, and actually, many Brits treat it as a badge of honour because we're naughty like that. So it's like, yeah, of course, I thought I was going faster than that. But I, I, there's something about knowing that Big Brother's watching you that I think is missing on the roads. And we're so advanced. Missing. Yeah, we're so advanced in so many other areas of our lives. We feel we're being watched the whole time, but we're not really being watched in our cars in the same way. We're having our speed monitored, but not our behaviour or our skill. It's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I've always felt that I would love, and this is pretty fanciful. My head's gone over there somewhere now. I like the idea of there being an arbiter of every fifty-fifty ball. Driving is about fifty-fifty balls. <laughs> and it's good and it'd be good to have someone tell you straight away afterwards who was right who was wrong so you yeah. have a little dust up a little scuffle or you think what did you do wrong the next sign says you in the red bmw you were right or the next one they go you were wrong you were wrong about that i've just like a var like a yes, driving var exactly. exactly hawkeye or something that's telling us what we whether we were right or wrong because I, I that that stays with me i could sometimes have a, a little incident the wrong word but i can have a little sort of situation where i think to myself did I get that completely wrong? And I don't resolve it really until I get to the end of the journey. I'm still thinking, yeah, did you do anything wrong there or not? I love the idea of a higher power on a on a screen going, "You did that right." That other person was a complete cock. So Mot <laughs> motorway VAR, that's good. So, yeah. so the, and the other one that I I think you'd have to allow yourself is some bad behaviour. I think I told this story already. I was once driving across the Seven Bridge, uh, and there was a rude word on the sign, and it said. It said, uh, fuck it, it's my last day. <laughs> on, the, on the sign going over the seventh bridge. What's the worst they thought, can do? I thought I was so... Because it can't have been easy to get access to that particular keyboard. So whoever did that, you are an out-and-out -out legend. And it did make me nearly crash the Focus RS Gen 1 as it was then. It's early in the morning, it just said, fuck it, it's my last day. Um, 
So motorway signs done and dusted. Now, our two-car garage uh, this week uh, is an homage to uh, one of the greatest car designers uh, of all time, uh, Mr. Gandini, uh, who passed away, I think, last week. It wasn't this week. It was last week, wasn't it? Uh, his, his, his CV is so outrageous. It's actually worth going on to Wikipedia and seeing the list of cars that he designed. Uh, it's it's freakish, uh, his talents, frankly. And, and it spanned... The mainstream and of course the supercar which you can argue he he sort of defined what a supercar is really i i think the genesis of the miura is a bit confused i don't think we can completely attribute the miura to him there's all sorts of arguments about that one uh, we won't go into that now it's a soup of arguments uh but i think his his cv does lend itself to him being called the father of the supercar so two cock errors today uh refers back to of course i've got it here typed out it refers back to a brilliant television advert from the 1980s where they got Mr. Gandini uh, uh, and they filmed him going to work in a mm. sick BX that he just designed, going off to do his uh, his Centro Stile work for, for some supercar. And I think, was there, is it, I've not watched it recently. Is there a Countach in it or a Diablo? Countach. Countach. Yeah. So I, my, my question to my fellow addicts is, you're a young director and you'll be recreating the famous Citroen advert with Marcel Gandini, you must choose one of his ordinary cars and one of his supercars to star in the advert. No Clifford. What an amazing two-car garage. Um, my first day of work, I walked into that um, Canon's Fiat dealership, 1983, 25 quid a week, bit nervous, bit spotty, but excited. And there it was, the Fiat X19 Grand Finale sat in the showroom. And I'm like, what a fucking great job I've got here. So I'd 100% have the Fiat X19, the five speed, the 1500, the BBS knockoffy wheels, the dark red. I think there was a few colors in the Grand Finale. Um, on a C reg, maybe, but anyway, I'd have that. And and then um, so that would be my sort of normal car, cheap car, because he didn't do many saloons. Actually, it was all about the wedge, wasn't he? Really, everything was wedgy. <clears throat> and and even though even though I do have the fortunate position to own an Espada and I adore it, I wouldn't choose it for this TV ad. I would choose a Stratos. I've got a mate with a Stratos, um, Clever Jason, as he is known, writes a lot of our two-car garages. And when that thing rocks up, <clears throat> Edward and I had a little breakfast with him recently, didn't we? And you see that parked on Barclay Square. It's like a spaceship. Yeah. It's just an incredible thing. So tiny, so beautiful, um, almost designed for one person, let alone two people really you know that windscreen doesn't have one straight bit on it does it it's like a it's it's a spaceship out of um, it's, a, it's a visor it's, it's like a visor a from a from a from a crash amp isn't it it's, it is. like, isn't it? it's right out of close encounters of the third kind so i'd have i'd have an x19 grand finale in, in burgundy and a stratus in orange uh manish well i'm gonna bend this one because i loved him so much um, as the commercial opens, I've decided I'm going to star in this commercial myself. <laughs> so I've got my Italian villa. The door opens and um, I'm wearing a navy blue Laura Piana suit with a white shirt and a grey Hermes tie and black churches. The dog is Tuco. He's black, so that works. Um, I've never got on with black suits. I come down the stairs. I feel that I still have just enough hair to do a Gandini. I come down with Tuco and we pass a metallic blue Lamborghini Countach LP400, but I'm not taking that car to work. I open the door of my metallic blue Lamborghini Espada. I open it, I push the seat forward, Tuco jumps into the back. I get into the car, I drive to the office, I take out my lovely architectural, because that, that ad, he takes out, his, he has a mm. briefcase, a mm. beautiful architect's um, case, you know, where they keep their royal yes. drawing. He has that. He comes out, he looks up, and I wander into work, and I think that is my perfect, perfect day. 
Did you used to write soft porn novel um, movies and novels <laughs> in the early nineties? <laughs> yeah, Razzle, Forum. Uh, right, uh, Edward Lovett. What are you going to have? Well, I was thinking I'd be in the French Alps, and you would just hear the reverberations of exhaust notes going through through the Alps, and then you'd start seeing flashes of colours through the trees, and then. As you get towards the bottom of the mountains, you start to see the LP400 Periscopio and you see a Stratos chasing it and they're dicing, going to and fro, to and fro. And then they pull up outside the, the Citroen factory. I don't know where it is, but this one's at the bottom of the French Alps anyway. <laughs> and then it just cuts to the credits and says, our designer doesn't just do Citroens. And then it would just say Citroen. Nice. Something along those lines. It, we don't need uh, that. You, you, you can buy that. You don't, you, you're, you're thinking you're buying a Lamborghini, but actually it's a Citroen, but it does exactly what you need it to do. Edward, you know, um, at the end of the British commercial, they used to get Michael Jason. He often did lots of voiceovers and he had such a sinister voice. And at the end of that very beautiful BX commercial, he said, the Citroen BX. What did you drive to work in today? Yes, his <laughs> voice. <laughs> his voice is amazing. It was a time for heroes. Horror <laughs> movie. Uh, Chris Cooper. So um, there's just too much to choose from, but extraordinarily for this one, the boys and I independently all came up with the same two cars independently. Stratos. The supercar because it's just just nothing like it. Yeah. Um, a, a mate of ours, Danny Cornwall, had one that didn't ever seem to work very well. But clever Jason's was just when we saw it just for Christmas. That was oh, just about cool. the orange, orangey red. It's like yeah. the, the just, Dino red. Oh. Yeah, just wonderful. The ordinary car would be, and I'd forgotten it was called that at this at the time. It was called the, the Renault Five, but the Super Sank. The second generation Renault 5 was called the Super Sank because it was even super rarer than the first Renault 5. And the Super Sank GT Turbo was kind of my first grown up car when I started working. So yeah. it always has this special, it's kind of, you know, my first Gandini was a Super Sank GT5 Turbo. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you what the story because every time one of us tries to describe what the other is, it does sound like we're writing soft porn. Uh, and it just shows how hard it is doing good car adverts. Mm. But I think arriving in a Super Sank, probably a nice plain one. The silver, unadorned. dark silver. Yeah, yeah the silver with a hint of gold in it. It was a little... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that lovely two-door shape with the sort of the, the, the door handleless door with a little slider just in behind. Yeah. yeah. That just, I can feel it now in mine. Uh, that and a and a Stratos. I thought about a Marzal, but it's kind of like too unobtainium. So a Stratos is just. And when we all saw those pictures in the Roger Albert Clark rally of Seb Perez caning that Stratos, that noise just incredible. Yeah. yeah. God bless him. Rest in peace. Uh, Edward, you've been, haven't you? Yes, you haven't, Christopher. So <laughs> I'm a bit, bit torn by this because I posed this to myself, and I'm not. I'm a bit unresolved. I know the foot, the ordinary car isn't an obvious one. It's the it's the five series BMW because uh, and my advert. I I can't creatively describe how I want it to go, but I, but I I really want to to tell people how significant this man was. It, 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 his talents and his influence reached so far beyond what you what the obvious boundaries were. The E12 five series wasn't the Neuer Klasse. It was the car after that. Yeah. But it was, it had the most obvious Hoffmeister kink in the door. It, it defined 50 years of BMWs. And Gandini was the person that penned it. That's outrageous. You know, and, yeah. and on his CV, it's sort of tucked away somewhere. Mm. And also, you can get a 535i with an M stripe on that and that rubber ducktail spoiler. So that's, that's my daily car. Uh, the, and the problem with wanting to recreate an advert is you, you, you should either go with the same, very same car in the original or you should have something completely different. And I, I look at his list of supercars. You could choose almost any one of them, and they're all they are all cool as you know what. That's the that's the word. They're cool. They're not all obviously beautiful, but they all you can stand by any any one of them and feel immensely proud to own it. And I but I just think the uh, the first 
you know, single mirror uh, uh, Countach is, is the best yeah. supercar ever made. I don't, I can't yeah. see how you can have anything else. It's just that green one they have at the museum. Have you been to the museum? Yeah. The first, is that the earliest one? It's a green one. Yeah. It might be the most desirable looking motor car on the planet, mightn't it? It just, every time you see it, you, you think, that looks like a spaceship now. What does that look like? In it's the got the chrome. It has the chrome. It has a. Uh, it wait, um, is, it, is it chrome or is it sort of a light grey? Um, it's, oh. be it's, be it's, be it's beautiful. Yes. It's beautiful. Yeah. Sensational. Yeah. So, that, so I love the idea of trying to tell the story of his influence, really, because the idea that most BMWs owe the way they look to him is not common knowledge. Uh, there we go. Boring. Uh, I will now move on to the. To, oh, we've done that to the music round. The music round. Okay. Give me a, a piece of your favourite music. Three, two, one. One, two, three, Johnny. Uh, Chris Cooper. This weekend when we were driving around the Cairngorms, I remember they were called the Grampians. Cairngorm National Park is actually quite new. Um, I have my iPhone plugged in. And for some reason, something about my iPhone, when I plug it in, it just decides it's going to dial up Spotify. And every time I put the start of the car, it would play... Hero by Nickelback, which is quite sort of anthemic for some of the beautiful vistas and rolling and staggering. And somebody said we had a beautiful walk on Saturday around parts of the Balmoral Estate, which all opened to public. Somebody said if you go to the top of Loch Nagar, the big mountain in the Balmoral, you can see all the way to the Cheviot Hills. I thought that was quite heroic. So Hero by Nickelback. There we go. Manish. Uh, it's in tribute to Mr. Gandini and that commercial, it would have to be Vivaldi's Spring. Morse wouldn't like that. Uh, Edward. Now, Neil sent us a video yesterday. Oh, don't show it. I'm not going to show it. I'm not going to show it. But clearly, you, you had to set a playlist up for the era of the car. Was that the purpose? I know, it was Radio 2. It was, it was that was that was just coincidence, was it? It was coincidence. It was, oh, that's brilliant. It wasn't curated. No, it was Radio Two. Well, I had to go back to the noughties to look for yeah. some dance music. So I've got "World Hold On" by Bob Sinclair. Oh yes, nice. yeah, good tune. Good tune. Uh, Neil Clifford. This week, Matthew, I've been mainly listening to the Pet Shop Boys. Um, I love the Pet Shop Boys. Yeah, I'm sure I've had a song on it before. Anyway, left to my own devices, the Pet Shop Boys. I, I probably think, would. You know, you always think it's nine, 1990s. They were the 80s. They yeah. were so advanced. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So I was driving along yesterday and something randomly popped out of my old Apple iTunes thing. I think my, the you know, the connection dies and suddenly the, the car and the and the device have a little chat and your old iTunes starts playing. You think, yes. what is that? From? yes. Yeah, and sometimes it can be a really nice surprise. Sometimes it can shock you. I had a shocking one yesterday. I'm going to admit to it because it was a song I loved in my youth, and I, I, it's absurd. Who remembers that sort of cod gothic rock band called the Sisters of Mercy? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Alice. <laughs> and this corrosion came on, which is a sort of poppy rock thing, but it reminded me of, of being 16 again, and I, I sang along to it, to This Corrosion, with his absurd love vocals. So there yeah. you go, The Citizens of Mercy, This Corrosion. Yeah. How old do you feel, Manish? Um, uh, that's the end of episode 57. Oh, um, oh. Yeah, that's the king of supercars. And that's the one, isn't look it? at the curves on it. Uh, it is, it is chrome on the front. You're right, man. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes, isn't Thank it? You. Nice. Windows. It's a little Windows. Just genius. Yeah. Thank you very much for putting up with us. We're sorry it was uploaded late last week. There was a technical issue. Uh, it won't happen again. Uh, we appreciate your support, and we'll hopefully see you or you'll hear from us again for episode 58 next week. Bye bye. <laughs>